When my comedy career was through the roof, at one point I started getting anxiety and created stage fright. I had a major stand-up career in my 20s and did a thousand colleges as a stand-up comic and had a great Comedy Central career. Weird too. How do you explain to people not to poop on the things that you loan them? They should know. If your comedy starts to fall apart, if you think that's your identity, then you are falling apart. And you're creating a situation that this dies, I die. And it started being like, then I don't exist, then I'm not worth anything really was me identifying the lie that what I am is a famous comedian or what I am is the guy from 10 Things I Hate About You. Rip it and rip it. And then all of a sudden I decided to say into a camera, I'm done doing comedy clubs. Where I want to start is what I consider the beginning, which is the first time I would have seen you in 10 Things I Hate About You. How the heck did you get in that film? Wow, man, we're starting 20 years ago. We're starting... Oh. Yeah, so so the film, for, for anyone young, the film came out in 99. It was a uh, remake of Shakespeare's um, um, the Taming of the Shrew. Yeah. So 10 Things I Hate About You was the first audition I ever had. And it was really interesting because I went into this room with zero idea how to act or how I'm supposed to be. I had no headshot. I had no experience. And because I was kind of oblivious to that I needed those things, uh, I kind of went in there with this invincibility. Like I just thought I was great and didn't but know. Did you have an agent or was it no. an open call? It was a, a casting director that I took a class from a week before. And then <laughs> she thought of me for the part. And like literally there's all these experienced other actors in there waiting to go. And I just was like, I was a stand up comic. So I was like, I'm just going to bring my cheesy character in and, <laughs> and do this kind of stuff. And you know, what was crazy about it was, so I go in and not only did I get the part, but they wrote it to be bigger than it was. Like it was for like a two day part. And then they kept calling me and saying, it's bigger and bigger. Now you're at the school. Now you're the party host. Now you're golfing in the movie and all these different things. And so they, they rewrote the part to be bigger. But what was really fascinating to me about this is that audition I went in totally oblivious to all the rules of how auditioning works that you need to have an agent and all these things and just thought I was the shit. And then because I thought that I booked it and then I moved to LA and the first I got an agent that I just met on a plane. And then the first audition I got there was for a series of Burger King commercials where I was this kid on a football field trying to run back a kickoff. It was the first audition I had in LA and I booked that. And it was a huge bunch of commercials all of a sudden. And then the next audition I got was a friend that I did 10 things with, had a friend in a movie called Not Another Teen Movie. And he yeah. brought me in to audition for that. And I ended up getting that. And now here's what's crazy is I was so like, oh my God, like it, it's so easy to book anything. Like I could just do this. Early and success, like, what, right? Like, is it a gift or is well, it a curse? Well, this is what happened after that was I started going, what if I got an acting uh, teacher and like really started learning acting on a much bigger level? Like how much more would I book? And the acting teacher, in my opinion, took me away from the essence of what I am. In other words, like was like, you got to say it this way and you got to deliver it this way and you have to say the lines this way. And it, it's imagine Jim Carrey going through that process where he's suddenly losing what's Jim Carrey about this. And, and then all of a sudden he's like everyone auditioning for it. And all of a sudden I couldn't book anything for years. I got, I had a major stand-up career in my twenties and did a thousand colleges as a stand-up comic and headlined almost every major comedy club in the country many times and had a great comedy central career. But I went to audition after audition. And many times I took an acting teacher like right before it to go over it and go over the lines and everything. And she just took the element of Kyle out of it. And she was a very respected acting teacher. But what I learned from that is how much advice um, can kill you. Like a lot of advice can really take the essence and the spirit away of what you are. And we get so caught in like this world of like, I have to market this way, or I have to do it this way. Someone told me I have to say this way. And what we don't get is you have a guidance system that 
knows how to do everything. And how, I, I really wonder what my life had been had I not taken an acting teacher's class and just kept being me. But I also love where my life went. But like, I do look at those times and go, you know, I, there was a reason I was just booking everything right out the gate. And it was because I was being me and not being what I think I need to be to make someone happy. And, uh, you know, that's how you get everything in your life is being you. And when you start being there, you have to be energy. You lose that, you know? Yeah. That actually reminds me of, um, I'm working through a biography on Robin Williams Mm. and his time at Juilliard, you know, and everyone saw something in him and uh, he came into Juilliard really high up and then they kind of held him back, uh, I think, a year because they're like, oh, you're not quite ready. Yeah. And ultimately, they kind of, they <laughs> asked him, he left. They asked him to leave, he left. But it wasn't because of a lack of talent. It was because they realized that their process would deconstruct someone to rebuild it. And in the act of deconstructing Robin Williams, right? He would turn, he would lose everything that made him and he refused to do so. Yeah. And so I think most people don't realize, um, they, they know the comedy side of him. They know what he's capable of with, you know, Dead Poet Society. But I don't think most people realize that he was, you know, Juilliard trained. Mm. I I didn't know it was Juilliard trained. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah, and so I have to ask though about the caricature. So at that point in your life, did you I mean acting sounded cool and it was interesting, but stand up comedy acting like what was the goal? What was the direction you were working towards? Was it just like more stage time, more love? <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> Just there was an amazing career that was here. And, um, you know, I think that, yeah, what I was looking for then was how can I be the best? How can I when it's so weird because I often say this, if you told the 25 year old me what I would be doing in 20 years, I would be so shocked and weirded out. Like what? Like, like, like me as a 25 year old thought I'd be doing stadiums at 45 as a stand up comic, but I had so many shifts since then that if you showed this guy, Hey, just so you know, when you're 45, you're going to be holding space for women's feelings, like a lot of people's feelings and helping them transcend it. But I, there's moments where I was sitting in Costa Rica in a thing and there was like 20 people sitting around me in, you know, like they're at an event and like white soft kind of a robe type clothes just being comfortable and like i was just like this is where i end up like this is what i do but it is my calling it's like amazing what i do but back then it was like the life goal at 25 was that i'm gonna be one of the best comics and one of the biggest comics ever and and at 29 and 30 i had an amazing career going i had two number one comedy central specials and All I knew was, I didn't know anything about what I was, you know, like you're a comic and that's what your identity is, right? And if your comedy starts to fall apart, if you think that's your identity, then you are falling apart, right? Like there's a thing we have where we think I am the thing that's going well. Like for some people, literally, I am the five Porsches in the garage. I am the giant amount of money or negative. I am the victim story or I am whatever. And you're creating a situation that, as Wayne Dyer says, if this dies, I die. And part of my fall apart was at first moments of sabotage in my comedy career, meaning like when my comedy career was through the roof, at one point I started getting anxiety and created stage fright. And I didn't realize it was me needing to get closer to what I truly am. But when the stage fright showed up, it was like, what if I couldn't perform on stage? And it started being like, then I don't exist. Then I'm not worth anything. And this was where I wanted to become suicidal and all these other things. But it really was me identifying the lie that what I am is a famous comedian or what I am is the guy from 10 Things I Hate About You. And I think this is why so many stars go to drugs or suicide or whatever else, because you're under the illusion that you... Everything. It's not just fame. It's like you are the relationship. You are the current job you have. And when you lose that, you go, I'm worth nothing. Right? So for me, like that needed to fall apart for me to go, okay, what if I'm not, what if I can do stand up and it's a tool in my life and I can be funny, but what if I'm not identified as that? Does that make sense? It makes so I'm smiling right now. It makes so much sense because I've 
I am on the back end of having to do that same transition for myself. Mm. And so I started at 23, I started an agency and it, it was really hard the first few years. I'm not going to lie, but by, you know, my mid to late twenties, we were doing really well. And by my, I remember my 30th birthday party, like I rented out this restaurant, I invited all my friends and it was like, you know, it wasn't crazy, but, but I was turning 30 and I think it was like a $5,000 minimum spend, which, you know, was like a big thing for me. And so, um, I, by my early thirties, it's like, we were able to buy bigger houses and the business is doing well and it's multi-million and we're growing. But then I started to like get bored. And I started to stretch myself too thin. And uh, I thought we had to just do more and more, which made everything way more complex. And I didn't respect it. And so, you know, COVID, I think, shaked a lot of people up. But I was already, you know, 2019, I was already ready for a change. And it took me two years of asking, like, if I'm not the entrepreneur, if I'm not the agency owner, if I'm not the, the, the... I spent 15 years building something I thought I would do for the rest of my life. And if I'm not that, then what am I? And... um in that middle place, if I'm not this faith, if I'm not in this relationship, if I'm not this career, if I'm not this job, if I'm not the parent of this person, then what am I? How did you work through that? Because hmm. I don't know if I did it <laughs> right, but yeah. um, it's taken me three years, which is, which feels long. <laughs> what an honest question. I, I So yes, the first stage was the discovery that I'm not that's just a stand up comic. And then it started being like, I can transcend these things. I got into Tony Robbins and went from suicide anxiety to number one Comedy Central special and started seeing like, oh my God, like, okay, so now what I am is this person that can achieve everything in the world. And that's cool. But that also has like a, I can achieve everything so that I don't have to look at parts of me that are scared to be a failure, so that I don't have to look at parts of me that are scared to be too much or not enough or whatever. And eventually those need to be seen. So a way that I see it is the self-help world and spirituality has created a major emphasis on focusing on the positive in the past, which is great. But I also believe that the negative needs to be seen too. In other words, if there's a pattern in your body that feels unlovable or or alone or lonely or lost or too much or whatever, and you say to it, you're allowed to be alone in my body. Now you're actually acknowledging both the positive and the negative. And this is so much more to me what you are. In other words, what the biggest thing I could identify that I am is the space right here for all of these different patterns. There's no way that what I am is a specific story or a habit. Like if someone says, I'm a procrastinator. Okay, well, if that goes away, then you die, right? Because you can't... If, if I am a procrastinator, right? So really... Changing, changing habits can feel like death sometimes. It does. But only because you're identified as the habit versus that's just a shirt I'm wearing today. And does that make sense? Like that, that, mm. that habit is not me. There's no habit that's actually you. They're all transcendable. And I've one thing that changed my life in 2015 was listening to silence for two hours a day for a hundred days in a row. I started lis listening to silence, meditating, but without the same type of work or guided meditations that are often offered. Literally, yeah. I just sit, wake up sit up, no phone, nothing. And I listen to silence for two hours. And it is... Hold on, but I'm, I'm wondering why you use that wording, listening to silence, because silence cannot be heard. So don't you just sit in silence? Oh, or like, yeah. am I getting caught up on the, in the language here? Or no? Yeah, I think so. Because okay, silence can be heard. In other words, silence has information in it when we listen long enough. I mean, every idea you have comes from somewhere, every calling, right? And what we're used to looking at is what I find distractions, scrolling through social media just aimlessly, almost to not have to just sit with yourself and look at yourself and see something, right? So what happened was in 2015, I got really interested in what would happen if I woke up every day and just for two hours, just listened, like in a quiet room, you know, and just listened. And I watched as thoughts came up, thoughts going, oh, I hope I do this right. I hope I meditate long enough or I hope I... And then I noticed that energy would pass. So like, who was that? It wasn't me. 
Because it just showed up and then I'm still here. And that voice and another voice is like, am, am I going to get anywhere with this? Does this do anything? And then that would be gone. And then another voice would come in and it would leave. And I started realizing much more that I am the space or the silence that these little lingering energy voices are coming up in. And after about 45 minutes, I noticed that once the old voices of how do I and sabotage leave, it almost starts replacing it with what feels like a kind of higher, much more magical frequency of million dollar ideas, next step possibilities, unlimited worthiness, total freedom. It's like you're undoing the clouds of the lies of your life. And then you're starting to hear the callings, the next steps, the total freedom. From there, I had book ideas. From there, I created videos that got really viral. I was able to say no much more to things that I used to say yes to. Like, like there would be a egoic part that goes, you have to be showing up at every comedy club and every red carpet event and every, you know, whatever. And after I meditated for a long time, I would be like, no, you don't. It's not my highest calling to be a part of that. And it started making me want to connect more to me than being seen by the world. And ironically, the less I needed to be seen by the world, the more I was. And still there's aspects of me that have that neediness that still exists now, but it's smaller and smaller, I think, than what it used to be. It used to be my identity was see me and everything else is not true. And it just slowly dissipated into a giant wide opening of possibilities. And I noticed my ability to say no was a huge deal. Like... I, I would notice I'd wake up in the morning and be like, God, I have the busiest day. I have to call this person and this person. Then I would listen to silence or meditate for two hours. And I'd be like, I don't have to call any of these people. <laughs> like, I don't need to call them there. You know, it's a lot you know of- how um, you, can, you can know something and hear something, but it's sometimes the way the person says it is actually the way it sticks to you, right? And so as you were just describing this, You've unlocked something for me personally. Oh, wow. Um, I just finished, I've always struggled with meditation and I think meditation is great. Just like I think, you know, cold showers and hydration and getting up early and exercise and all that stuff. I think it's all part of a really healthy um, uh, physical, um, spiritual, uh, and especially from a mindset or a mental health point of view, I think it's really important. And yet I've never been able to do it really consistently. I just don't like it. I don't can commit to it. It feels like a chore. And so I just finished, um, I did 10 10Ks over 10 days. I wasn't feeling good. I want to work on my running more. So I'm like, I'm just going to do 10 10Ks over 10 days. And I so loved that hour of running. Mm. It was like, and, and it was to the point where I finished on Tuesday. Wednesday, I went to the gym and did my normal run and my knee kind of hurt. Yesterday, I took the day off. And I'm like, just so craving it. I'm just so missing it because everything becomes clear and there's no distractions and the ideas are just so strong. And I can kind of cut through the bullshit. And it's like, as you were talking, I was like, my hour of running is like almost like meditation. (laughs) And maybe I'm breaking the rules, but it feels like the outcome might be the same. So who cares? Yeah, I think, no, that's great. Like one of the aspects of meditation is just you're not bothered by your phone and staying connected to everything going on in the world and needing to know what's happening in politics or some scandal or what, you know what I mean? You're just kind of like connecting to what I feel is God, like much more love much more here like finding enoughness in the nothingness do you know what i mean like that this like when you're running in that place you're probably hearing silence or maybe i don't know if you're listening to music or what but like when you're in that you're connecting to yourself and you have no agenda and you have no have to and you have no whatever and all those have to things that show up in your mind leave and start to get replaced with callings like what you want like what if i kept doing this every day like it gives you these little callings to move forward right and that is another form of meditation and as a thought on what you said about struggled with meditation an offer i have at the level if you want it is that when you meditate your mind at first goes crazy but i want you to know that's your mind and not you and If you listen and even it goes crazy for an hour, that it still was a successful meditation. In fact, uh, so a lot of times we think we're struggling with it, but really it's almost like kind of like the belief is I 
a lot of people believe I'm, my mind's too busy to meditate, which is kind of like saying I'm too chubby to go to the gym. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've heard oh. that one before. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, go there, you know, and it'll change. And this is why I know people who like people on your side, people who meditate. I want to say meditation is bullshit, but I know it's not. And, um, you know, I had someone the other day who was talking about my 10 Ks and they're like, I can't run. And I just didn't accept that. I was like, yes, you can. Maybe you can't do my pace. Maybe you can't do my speed. You're not started. You can't do 10 K. That's fine, but you can run. And he was just so sure he can't run. He's like, I cannot run. And I'm like, that's just not true. Like, I just, I will not accept that. That's not true. And so this is why whenever I'm speaking yeah. to someone who spends a lot of time with spiritual practices, meditation, or what have you, I do not ever want to say like, it does not work. Because I know that you're on the other side and you're like, I can't accept that. <laughs> well, it's, that, well, it's not only that, but it's a funny concept to think the way that life works is you can do something before you start doing it. That's like a kid that can't walk being like, well, I can't walk, so I might as well not start trying it's like how it works is they fall down a long time right like over and over again and then eventually they can but imagine if a child like first try was like i can't walk yeah, yeah i'm out i already know <laughs> carry me everywhere me. for like all the time and so what it's so interesting one thing i got really into this year is jujitsu um really big time i love jujitsu but i gotta say that concept that you're talking about of I can't or it's not like me was so big in my body. I had a mom that was wonderful and also very worried about different ways that I could get hurt. You know, if you do football, you'll get paralyzed. If you ride a motorcycle, you'll whatever. And I took on everything she said as a fact. And my body was so full of how many ways I could get hurt. And I spent a long time developing skills like comedy and hearing to do a lot of amazing things, but it, it's always been in my body that it's not like me to do jujitsu. I just have no idea how I know that I could get strangled. I could get hurt. I could hear every voice of my mom, but every voice of my mom isn't me. It was her fear based on her childhood. And when I started going to jujitsu, the first few times it was scary. I was like worried I'd be paralyzed. I was worried I'd be, you know, I'd fall asleep from the wrong chokehold or someone break my arm. And then after doing it a while, those fears like saw that's not true and they left. And now I'm in this kind of middle where I'm like, I think I can. My body's like, I think I can do this. And I get excited to show up again and grapple with people. And I'm getting good. I'm starting to choke people out and pin them. And this for me, <laughs> You're like, it's fun to knock people unconscious. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a very primal area of my body that I've never connected to. And I've always had that I have external success to not have to look at this. I've always had, I'm floating enough on that I'm famous as a comic or, or that I'm successful as a speaker to kind of look at the oneness aspect of world, the world, but totally deny the primal masculine energy that's in my body. There's a dude that wants to be a protector. There's a dude that has boundaries. The old me would, the old me in avoidance of conflict would just make peace with everyone, even if they were terrible to me. And mm -hmm. the new me now is like, get the fuck away. You know what I mean? Hope I can swear. How can I say away? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Away's yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Bad. Bad. <laughs> and, the, and the new me has a space and it and it has this knowing that if on an average scenario now if someone came into a restaurant with bad intentions there's a me that has a higher and higher chance of taking them every time i take a class and that is a feeling that i've never accessed in my body but it hits every tone of what i could have said years ago which is it's not like me i don't do jujitsu i'm not that kind of guy i don't fight i'm not like that and it takes showing up and being completely lost in it and totally not getting what's going on for a while and being scared for a while, but just doing it. I mean, if you have stage fright, but you go on stage every day, that's going to have to leave. It just, it'll get bored because you're proving to it that the fright doesn't have control over you. That's where it leaves, right? Like we have this fear that we can't do something. And if we honor that fear and don't do it, then the fear runs your whole life. But if you have a giant stage fright fear and then you go on stage and you speak, it goes away because it would it it's obviously wrong. You have enough evidence that you can do this. So at least you are so awesome. You are so awesome. <laughs> I can't you. wait to see you just like like turn into a machine. You know, I um I just started getting fit five years ago. I started working out. I used to be like 
50, 60, 70 pounds heavier. Wow. Never really worked out. Um, and I started lifting weights two years ago. And I have had that, I have had that transformation myself where, you know, I, I think a little while ago I read Jordan Peterson's 12 rules, and one of his rules is stand straight. Mm. And just from a dominance point of view. And I do have that thought sometimes now where it's just like, I'm not going to take shit from people the way that I used to. And I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm sorry if I'm bigger. You know, I used to intimidate people all the time. They always told me that I was too intimidating. I ask pointed questions and I come in, I'm super interested and um, I speak quick and I sound smart or whatever. And so I would always try to like come in soft and not be too direct and make sure I don't intimidate anyone. And a little while ago, I was just like, that you know what like this is me <laughs> like yes. it comes from the health it comes from the confidence and it comes from facing some of those little fears that you don't realize you're getting handed just like you say and you also align with people that are powerful that wouldn't be intimidated by you being you in other words like uh, jordan peterson and joe rogan that intimidate people you know there's an intimidation factor from some of the most powerful people in the world <laughs> The problem isn't those people. It's the people that are intimidated by them, you know, <laughs> and like you shouldn't sh shrink yourself to not trigger everybody, you know, have you ever have you ever met them? I mean, on the comedy circuit, you must have met Rogan, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've seen him at clubs and stuff like that. Yeah. Have you met Peterson? I have not met Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I sometimes wonder because I would love to talk to him mostly because um I think some of his stuff sounds, he's such a fast talker and it sounds so right when he says it, but there's so many underlying assumptions he's making and so much stuff. It's like, I don't think I could keep up with the guy. Like he, he would intimidate me to have on the podcast. Isn't that interesting that you can be intimidating to other people, but there's people that it wouldn't intimidate you. Oh yeah. Isn't everybody intimidated by somebody though? I think that, I think that one thing we have are patterns that we think are a worldwide thing. And the more I've done this work when working with so many different people, I've learned that our patterns are our thing. Like, so for instance, I had a woman recently that I was doing a one on one with and she said, um, I can't be myself around other people. And I said, why? And she goes, cause if I am, then they judge me. And I said, so you can be yourself with other people. You just have decided judgments not allowed. And then later she was talking about something else. And she says, yeah, this guy was saying to me and she goes, I don't mean to judge. And I stopped her and I said, you have a belief that judgments not allowed. And, and it's not that we're here to go judge everybody or shit talk them or whatever. It's that in your body is a repression and a judgment of judgment that needs to come out. Right. And so we all have, I find a different trigger word. Some is guilt, some is shame. What I'm just wondering is since intimidation came up twice in a row, if it happens to be a thing, I don't want to, intimidation is bad is what I hear. I'm super judgy. Like, mm -hmm. like I know I am and, and I've been working. Maybe you can help me with this. You know, they Are say you? that the best way to not fear others judgment is to not be so judgmental of others. And so I've been working on letting that go. But in the lack of trying to judge others, so so everybody does everything for a reason they think is right. I don't know the full story. I need to approach things empathetically. We got to get to the understanding because it's usually a miscommunication. So like I can do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, with without the judgment, I don't I, I feel like I don't have anything to like compete against or strive for or work for. And you can say, well, those are all bad. You know, you, why do you need those things? Well, like. I was out on a run and I keep talking about running, but this isn't just about running, but I was out on a run and I'm killing myself in like, you know, 90 degree heat and it's like day six and I'm dying and I'm, and I see some dude walking so slow, overweight on his phone in my way. And he's wearing like the most expensive workout shirt ever that says like run Nike run or something. And I was like, that guy doesn't deserve to wear that shirt. He's not even doing this. So then I was like, oh, I'm going to work a little harder. So <laughs> sometimes judgment's good. Sometimes it's bad. Everyone always goes, oh, you have to discern. That's yeah. the part I struggle with the most. Well, one way that there's, I find there's really healthy judgment is what if when you felt that trigger about that guy, which is understandable, I find that almost every trigger that we have in a moment is trying to show you something from before that moment. 
So for instance, let's say you're really sad because you're going through a breakup. There's an aspect of you that really is sad that you're losing the person, but also at the same time, that person could feel like a parent. And so you actually think your dad's leaving you again, or you feel like you're not connected to your mom anymore or whatever. And really a trigger is trying to show us something from before it. So when you were running and the dude with the wrong Nike shirt and was walking that way was there, what was it bringing up? Like what, what was the feeling in your body that you felt with him about like, what was the, you know what I mean? Like, what did it make you feel that he existed there? It was, um, it was like the, uh, like the posing. It was the like, Mm, phony you know like yeah it was um i'm here working so fucking hard Mm. and i'm still not getting the results that i want and um Mm -hmm. and i'm legit and that guy doesn't like (laughs) i know like i wanted to use it as fuel of like oh like like i'm for real and and i used it on my run I, i turned it into like but it was this moment of just of just like why do people think that they can just buy something to make them feel better and they won't even do the work? Like that was the like, he's not even doing the work. Right. <laughs> Here I am killing myself. <laughs> right. Let me ask you this. Do you think, to play with this for a second, do you think part of it is the belief that you have to kill yourself? In other words, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. If if I'm not if I'm not nauseous or dizzy, then it w- wasn't a real workout, and okay. and then I'm phoning it in. And if I'm phoning it in, we're about to touch on something now. I think yeah. I think where we're going here is something I wanted to talk to you about, and and maybe I'm skipping ahead. You tell me if I am. But you talk about death a lot. Mm-hmm. It just seems to come up in your content, and you talk about death a lot. Yes. And so I used to be Christian, and when I was Christian, I was able to say there's something on the other side and there, there's this thing we're working towards and there's always going to be better. And, you know, and we have to live today, but there's a promise of tomorrow. And over the last number of years, I've moved away from that, um, that, that religion, that school of thought, that thinking, that spirituality, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I know, I hear people say that, you know, if this is life, you have to make the most of it because, um, you know, you never know when your time is up Every minute matters. And that motivates some people. That does not motivate me. That makes me feel nihilistic. That makes me feel apathetic. That makes me feel sad. Like if this is all that life is, this is it. Um, now, I don't know if, if I jumped too far ahead or if that's where you were going with it, but that's what popped into my head. Well, there's a huge aspect of what I believe has just changed in the truth of where the world is right now in the last three years versus before it. Old self-help does a lot of great content on helping people move from a victim to someone who makes it happen. And that's awesome. And there's been a lot of incredible content that actually served those times that are really good. A great example is a sentence Wayne Dyer said in a movie called The Shift. And I'm sure he said it in other things around that time. This was in 2006, I believe. He said, don't die with your music left in you. Right. So there's this great quote, don't die with the music left in you. Let me tell you about the shadow to that quote. Now, the amount of one on ones I get from people who are horrified that they are wasting their life, not getting some book out or starting some business out of some pressure that self-help content now has created on them. Right. That we have an arbitrary idea of what fully living your life is. And now you have a million new coaches and a million new people out of this pressure of don't waste your life. And it's such an F you to God or the universe or the now or whatever created you to act like we're here to egoically decide what our purpose is when it's like, dude, I created you. You're in purpose every second. You're in purpose when you're off. You're in purpose when you're lost. You're in purpose when you're depressed. This is all on purpose. It keeps re-steering itself and taking you to better things on its own. And a lot of what I think is the biggest aspect, I think positivity is great, but it's almost a denial of death. And death is an absolute certainty. And when I allow aspects of myself, 
a relationship that no longer aligns dies. I mean, there's death happening every second. Your fingernails are dead. Your hair, you know what I mean? Like everything, skin cells are just falling off of us right now while we're talking and then new ones are forming. Death is a the biggest part of life and the full acceptance of that versus the kind of, I have to make it happen denialism of that, um, which is really a fear of that inevitability is where there's so much suffering. And so I find that make it happen. If it's a calling, it's different, but there's a lot of make it happen that's so that I'm not a failure to my dad, so that I'm, you know what I mean, finally worthy of something, which implies there's some negative thing that needs to be seen too. In other words, a negative can be driving the motivation, right? Like, in fact, it's even said at seminars, if people talk shit about you, you're going to show them who you really are. And now you're literally basing your new you on revenge to them, which still means what they said matters to you. And that you're still handing them all your power, even if you became a multi-billionaire to show them they're wrong. Like, you're still saying what they feel matters at all. And there's a you inside that is like, I feel unloved. And what if you could just be with, you're allowed to feel unloved in my body and let the energy see that you're with it, even if it feels like a failure. See, when we were kids... We had parents that usually in most cases said things like whatever, either they told us you're a failure or you're worthless, or or they said, don't ever be a failure. And if you want me to be proud of you, the highest consciousness that our parents knew and overall was very much like you are what you do. And if you want my approval, I love you based on that you got straight A's or that you won on this thing or whatever. Everyone has a different set of parents, but I think you get what I mean overall. And then we grow up and now we're in a time where you're not what you do, you're what you are. And what exists in you under the doer is often a little boy that says, also, if I don't achieve that, if I don't run every day, if I don't go to jujitsu every day, would you still love me? If would, am I still enough? And what I've just been so blown away by is the last few years to me feels like the universe or life or God has shined the light too bright on the real dark things that we don't want to look at. And so we can't positive our way out of them anymore. And we now have a glimpse of who the media really is and who the government really is and who, you know, and no matter how much you achieve, there's still a boy that's abused in here that wants to be seen. And once that's seen, it leaves. So imagine that what the universe is doing is it's bringing up traumas in our body that happened in the 70s or 80s or whatever, that we've been living an identity to avoid feeling, right? Like if dad hit me because I got an F in school, then I'm going to get straight A's and then I'm going to create an identity that gets straight A's so I never have to feel that abuse again. But then you identify now as this doer and you don't even realize that you're doing it so you don't get hit. Even if dad's dead and you're 50, you're still a doer and you're calling that me. That might not be you. That might be an identity you created to not get hit. And now those, I got hit, my mom shamed me, I was abandoned are all coming to light now. And people are either staying in the pattern and life is getting crazier. They don't want to look at it. They're going to drink it away or go hurt someone else or gossip or become addicted. Or you're the now and it's going to look at all these patterns and they're going to gently leave. And this is why a lot of projects that we start and relationships that we start fall apart really quickly now. Do you notice if you ever had a like, I'm going to start this new and then you you don't because it was... Dude, I, dude I'm an entrepreneur, man. I like, like yeah. I can't even get out of my head all of the ideas because they come so right. fast. <laughs> yes. And, and here's an offer for that. See yourself as an elevator and the ideas as floors and that you can pass some floors. A free moment for me was I don't have to get every idea out. There are also ideas for me. You know, you know what I do? I get Otter, this transcription app, and I just say it and it goes into a file and I go, oh, I'll look at that one day. And I never do. But you at least it's, at least it's, it's out. It's gone. <laughs> and for me, like the amount of amazing things that'll show up that I'm just like, yeah, I, I, even though it's awesome, I don't have to do it has been a really freeing thing. And then I realize I'm more the space that the ideas are coming from than the ideas. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm more interested in the space than the ideas. 
<laughs> because so the, does that make sense? So I, I'm interested right now because I think I've thank you. I, I don't want to pass it up. Thank you sure. because you've been very generous and helpful in terms of being able to break this down for me. And sometimes I'm, I'm like the guinea pig that the audience gets to watch. But oh, I um, think that's but we're all here to be vulnerable. <laughs> you know. Well, but I'm curious because we started off the conversation talking about comedy, talking about acting. You know, so so like I set this up purposely as like, hey, here's one side of you, the side of you that started with a career point of view. And then I think everyone now just witnessed what you've been doing for the last 10, 15 years and how good at this you are and how deep into this you are and, and how transformative it would be. So I'm, you know, there's two different chapters of your life we just saw, or two different versions of you. And I'm trying to understand how you went from the first one to who you are today then. Hmm. Well, a, a huge moment in my life was a shift and an awakening of the power of letting go. And that when you let go of something, this is a thing that I discovered when I was working with my friend Diego. When you let go of something, you are only stressed because you can measure what you will lose and you can't see what you'll gain. And I went from motivation to letting go of what felt not truly me and addictive patterns in my life. And I'm not a master at it. There's still some that maintain and are there. But I watched myself go through miracle after miracle in 2010. Yeah, 2010 or 2011. It was, uh, I think it was 2010. Um, the summer of 2010, when I just to start, decided to start seeing what would happen if I just let go of things that were things that I used to identify of as I have to have in my life. And a great example would be, at one point, I'm not this now at all. This was necessary for that time. But I decided to go raw vegan for 90 days. I'm not now. And I'm not saying if this is about raw veganism, it's about changing the pattern. <laughs> and I like how anytime someone uses the word vegan, you have to be like, oh, disclaimer. <laughs> well, it's so important to me just that people don't hear this as I'm saying the answer is veganism. Yeah. As much as I'm saying the answer is doing what at the time is a calling that's trying to, it's like a ladder rung that's taking you to something new. And in 2010, I wanted to know what would happen if I went raw vegan for 90 days. And I think part of the reason was I associated a lot of love to restaurants as a kid. I felt the only time I really had my parents' full attention, there wasn't a TV on, there wasn't an office where they could take business calls, was at a restaurant. So I associate a lot of love to like Mexican food and all these different things. So there's an energetic pattern in here. So when I said I'm going raw vegan for 90 days, I suddenly had to undo myself from the addiction of feeling loved in that condi conditional way. And when I went raw vegan for the first 45 days, for the first 30 days, I just noticed my taste buds were changing. After 30 days, someone walked by me with a hot dog and all I smelled was chemicals and metal. And I, I noticed 30 days ago, I would have liked that. So that I was like, what the hell does that imply? So I started going, there are things that feel like a part of me right now at one point could feel separate from me and heavy. So it started going, what if we do it with other things? What if we say no Facebook for a while? What if we say no dating for a while? I got to day 45 and I noticed I was about to go do a comedy club and I noticed it felt heavy to me. It didn't feel like a calling to me. I didn't want to go do it. I didn't want to get on another freaking plane. I didn't want to go sit at a hotel next to a, a, a whatever Applebee's and then do the comedy club in that city. And I didn't want to do morning rate. I didn't want to do all these things. And all of a sudden, it one point was my calling and now it's dropped in vibration to me because I'm ascending myself. I'm like on a frequency that's higher than at one point what was my dream career. So I decided to say into a camera, uh, I'm done doing comedy clubs on the road because it now was heavy. When you let go, you can measure what you lose. You can't see what you'll gain. So I undid that. The next week, I had my friend Diego film me making 500 videos for different colleges and literally saying the people that booked the colleges by name. And they knew 10 things I hate about you and my comedy career. And they were excited. I would be like, this is for Diane Johnson at North Idaho University. My name is Kyle Cease, whatever. I'd like to do the lecture circuit at your school now. I want to be a, a I want to shift people and combine comedy and transformation. And... uh 
a, a bunch of comics were like, why aren't you doing comedy? What are you making videos for? And then a ton of them said yes at a much higher price. So all of a sudden, I went from doing a comedy club where I, I spend five days and maybe get 3000 bucks or whatever to going one night to a college, getting more like 10,000 and like a hundred of them said, yes. So you're starting to see the numbers are crazy. Right. And all of a sudden I let go of what I could see. And then it made space because I went up vibrationally that like, I'm even bigger than my comedy career. And it said, what if I combine comedy and transformation? And I remember my ego going, well, the way you want to do it, no one's done that. And I felt my soul go, no one's done that. What if you create your own field? Like, what if all of a sudden you're at every Chopra seminar and every Eckhart thing and Tony thing and all of a sudden the work went through the roof. I was suddenly offered so many more things because it was like, I'm the speaker that can really do transformational work, but also I have 20 to 25 years, 12 to 32. So I guess 20 years of stand up comedy and bringing those together made it very unique and, you know, had a New York Times bestseller book. And all of a sudden, this whole world showed up and my events are called Evolving Out Loud. And they're, you know, we've done the Dolby Theater where they do the Oscars two days, 3,400 people, um, really big events. And it's so funny because I was leaving a world that I could see was really good, but a way better world was available. I was leaving comedy which was funny because I had a dream as a comic to do the Dolby theater, but I literally had to let go of my career and then watch like the universe or God create a better career. Cause it was much more following feeling than doing anything like it left doing, there was no more effort. There was much more say yes to what feels expansive and say no to what feels blocked. And I noticed that I know that a few things, if it feels heavy, in most cases, that's because it doesn't align with you. And so a lot of our efforts that we bring in comes from that we're also holding on to shitty relationships, shitty jobs, you know, things that are you're wasting cool. so much energy trying to get yourself jazzed for these heavy things, right? Right. And you're just also carrying suitcases and don't know it. You're carrying heavy things that aren't you. And I believe something that sounds really crazy to people, but I believe the world mirrors you. I believe that as I move towards a higher thing and don't have this have to energy that really was created as a child to like not get hurt by my parents and then just let go, I find the world opens up much more and the people around you just change and you start to find friends that are in that same alignment and abundance is a normal thing to you versus a thing you got to achieve and get to because you're not really worthy of it. And so for me... That's how I left stand up. And then it like burst evolving out loud. And these events that we do that are 1400 seats up to 3400 seats. And they're always jam packed and always, you know, amazing. And then this last year, we brought 650 plus thousand dollars to Operation Underground Railroad. The movie, The Sound of Freedom is about Tim Ballard who created Operation Underground Railroad. So we brought in all this money to stop child trafficking by doing events and having the money go to that. I got to tell you, that feels amazing. And that was- I, all I love this. I, sorry to interrupt. I love this story hmm, thank so you. much um, because the narrative that I had in my head, and I think the narrative that most people out in the world would say is, you started stand up, you started acting, you flamed out, and now you're doing the quote unquote easier thing because, um, you know, like, like you couldn't make it in the big leagues. Your dream got crushed. So now you're just kind of in the minor leagues. That would be the worldly narrative for your career. Well, I'll tell you, I understand that belief. This is the most fulfilled I've ever been in my life. <laughs> I have glimpses of had I stayed in stand up comedy. And I'm sure there would have been great things, but I also saw older comics that started getting more and more bitter, jealous of other younger success that happened right away. The idea of living on the road my entire life, the idea of the, where that was headed, it wasn't my true highest. And my soul, my career, my impact, my, I mean, the people, 
the amount of letters we have, thousands of letters of people that their life changed from it. And still, by the way, I'm moving to a frequency that goes even this in some ways has run its course. Like I still do it, but I'm more worried about, or not more worried, more excited about what I am and discovering just the full essence of what I am. But that's not what happened. I literally won in 2009 Comedy Central stand-up showdown and one number one comic and had two number one specials. The career was enormous. And I just felt as I went deeper and deeper that it wasn't my highest anymore. And I don't believe success is only measured in how many people like you. It's measured in how fulfilled you are. To me, some of the most successful things I can do is sit outside at night and look at stars and to be and to know that I'm enough no matter what I achieve. And by the way, what the achievements are after that are so much bigger because it's not it's a byproduct of your vibration much more than it's your effort. You know, when you put a ton of effort into something, very often when you get something, you often also feel like you don't deserve it. In other words, you <laughs> oh my goodness, that is so true. Right? There's a reason for that. Like when someone thinks they're worth 20,000 a year, if they win the lottery, they're so excited because it's not like them to be able to receive this kind of money. They're someone who makes 20,000 a year. And this is why a lot of times lottery winners go broke because it's undone from the story that you have deep in your body. And I find that you don't want to get to a place where it's exciting what's happening to you because that almost implies you're not worthy of it. You want to get to a place where it's normal. That's what happens. It's not weird to bring in millions a year. It's not weird to bring money to other charities. It's not weird. It's normal. It's a normal thing to be successful. It's a normal thing to be impactful. It's a normal thing to heal. And so... um I know that's the narrative sometimes that people have, and that's not what happened. And I'm also fine with, with people believing that, but I've heard that before and I've seen people say that. And, um, I wouldn't have my six year old daughter had I not made this shift. I mean, <laughs> like where my life is and what I've learned and what I've created and what I've seen, I wouldn't trade for anything ever like this is this i'm right with myself you know so and i get to be that girl's dad and nothing beats it man she's the best this is much more exciting to me than headlining in an enormous venue like you know being a space with her and learning from her and creating with her nothing beats it oh man i can feel that um I was talking to my grandfather yesterday. I went and visited him. He's 94. He's turning 95 this year. When he's that age, I get I visit him about once a month. I try to. And um, when he's that age, each time I say goodbye, I'm just thinking like, I want to make sure that every goodbye is the right type of goodbye. But we were talking about my family, you know, and mm. my wife and I met in high school. We've been together 23 years, married 18. We have four kids. Wow. Our oldest is turning. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I will accept that. Um, and when I used to say we were high school sweethearts, people used to go like, oh, I hated that. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm damn, I am damn proud mm. of these kids and this family and this household um, and the creativity and, and all of that. And we were talking and he's like, he's like, you've got a good family. And I stopped for a moment. And I was like, I'm really proud of them. Like I'm, I'm proud of our work. I'm proud of my wife and I and, and our work. And um, I don't usually, um, I love feeling proud, but I always need other people to recognize me for me to feel pride. And there was this moment yesterday where I was like, no, I'm really, I am really proud. I'm really proud of how hard we work to be parents and to be there. And I'm sure we make lots of mistakes and that scares me. I'm sure you feel the same thing, right? Like oh, yeah. you go too much left and suddenly they're blaming you for not being right. And you know, you right. go too this way and there's not that way. And it's like, ah, oh, how do we navigate this thing? But what I just saw, you know, for our listeners, you know, the feeling in your face and the moment of you saying about your daughter, it's like this, that it's more important than anything else, isn't it? 
You know, I'll tell you, yes. And where I was headed, where I was headed as a person, I'm so grateful God humbled me in so many ways and stopped me from just continuing to be a successful comedian and not having to go inward and look at things. Because I think I would have been so much more egoic than I am now. I think I would have been so much more. I wouldn't have had a kid probably would have been just living on the road. Aren't I great? Look how famous I am. And I think I would have just been an absolute dick. And like where it was headed was just all I knew since 12 is that people see me on a pedestal as a comedian or someone. And I accepted that for a long time and stayed on their pedestal. And like, aren't I great out of this secret insecurity that I don't know that you'd like me any at all if you didn't see the comedy. And that when I could, could go on a stage and own that stage and just have everyone in the world liking me and women attracted to me and everyone wanting me to come to their parties and everything like that. It was like, but if I, if you meet the guy without that, because I don't know the guy without that back then, um, you see a lot of insecurity under that mask. And so, yeah, maybe I could have stayed in comedy and become a huge success. And maybe there would have been some humbling here and there, but maybe I would have just stayed never knowing who I was while thinking I'm the greatest ever and just not knowing about humanity, not knowing about my heart, not knowing about other people's feelings and having a child um, is so amazing at it's so helpful to move you to a place because that part of you that wants to run and the part of me that wants to become a black belt in jujitsu, like a child is an ongoing, no goal thing that you get done and leave. It's always there. And it causes us to connect to a much deeper here presence and a listening that that often you don't get any external rewards for. Like I will sit with Vivi and hear her and then be proud of myself internally and not get a standing ovation for it. And, you know, and have that connection with myself and with her. And I'm just so thankful. Like, this is why I think really dark times are the best things for us because they, if we understand this is the purpose of it, they get us so much closer to the truth of what we are and what we actually are under the characters and under the denial of our trauma is miraculous, is capable of doing so much more with no effort and really requires seeing reality as it is versus through the bubble of your don't hurt me trauma or over motivation story or whatever. And every fall apart that took me right to the edge of suicide, which has been several different times, then took me to a new level of discovery in myself, maybe a year later, maybe two, like there were times where there was a lot of suffering and not understanding why, but having a teeny knowing this is on purpose and it cutting off my ability to achieve things a certain way to keep that drug going and then made me get humble and made me listen and made me own my stuff, but also call bullshit on other people or whatever. And really find something that's like so much bigger than look how famous I am. And th that's like, who cares? Famous and arbitrary passing nothing thing. It's who cares? And there's a ton of people famous that are totally depressed. Most child stars die young. Like there's a reason that's not the ultimate goal. <laughs> the ultimate goal is not how big is the stadium. The ultimate goal is... Do I know myself? Do I know God? Do I, am I a caring parent? Am I a caring person? Am I able to be humble and say, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, and then create space to learn always, you know, that's more fulfilling to me, I guess. After you are, you are so <laughs> remarkable, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can listen. I could, I'm just like, I can just listen. I have two questions for you. The first, um, you might say more about me actually than you, but, Everything that you've shared, I agree with, you know, especially the world reflects you. Oh man, you know, like I was watching Downton Abbey. What a weird place to learn some life lessons, but I'm watching Downton Abbey. I don't know. Have you ever watched a show? I've not seen it. 
I know about, uh, them, but I haven't seen. Well, there's like three different sisters, and there's a family and all this stuff. But there's a middle child. The middle, you know, the oldest is, of course, um, really driven, and the youngest is um, is friendly and outgoing and caring and precocious. And the middle child is like, whoa, Eeyore, right? Like, woe is me. Um, and there's this line, like, like two or three se- series in. <laughs> Where she's like, nothing works out for me. And it's just like, well, of course nothing works out for you because you approach everything like nothing is going to work out for you. And if you just, mm. if like, there's, you have so many opportunities. Like, it's just ugh, so frustrating. Um, and so I agree with everything that you say. And I so appreciate you sharing it and the fact that you've done this work and you've done it for a long time and you can explain it so well. Mm, I struggle with the psycho babble. Um, self-help, me too. Spiritual bullshit type thing because it's like I come from. Uh, I still hold on to the like. Well, if you could have made it as a comedian, that's the real thing. Mm. And instead, you're doing this other thing. And so, I so agree with you. Like, like more money. Uh, you've worked on yourself. You have room and space for your daughter now in your life. Um, like you're speaking to where how much you've progressed. And how much more opportunity you have in front of you to be healthier and happier. And so I know the answer is like, well, screw them. Who cares what they think? But but it, it bothers me that all of this stuff that just feels so true and sees so true, and that might be confirmation bias, but it bothers me that most of the world thinks it's like bullshit for rich, privileged, crazy people. Do you know what I mean? Trying to think of which way to what's coming up on that. That you're saying that that the perception of self help is that it's for bullshit, rich, crazy people. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard that a lot. I, yeah. I I tend to when whenever an author. So so you you wrote a book, The Illusion of Money: Why Chasing Money Is Stopping You from Receiving It. Whenever I have someone on who's an author, I always go through Amazon reviews because I want to know what people have to say, mm. good and bad. And, and I pulled a line from one of your negative reviews, you know, and this is the quote, people who are successful chasing their dreams are either coming from a position of privilege, extraordinarily gifted, lucky, workaholic, or all of the above. Now, that doesn't speak to the psychobabble stuff, but it's in the air of like, well, it only works if, you know, and it's good for them. And, you know, and it's just like, mm, it just bothers me. And I was trying to decide if I should bring it up or not, but you've, sure. you've hit every other thing I've thrown oh, yeah. at you so far. And, and that's like, not even a review of the book. That's just like a vague sentence of their hypothesis about life. Do you know what I mean? Like that's that person's yeah. thing. They didn't even say a thing that they didn't like about the book. Or I don't even mean it like defensively. I mean it more like I find that every, this is going to sound weird, every negative belief that I have in myself or anyone has comes from assumption. And I have yet to be able to uh, not break it down into something and show that the reflection of the negative is how they see the world based on how they saw their childhood. And I mean that with me too. I believe every single sentence we have that is negative is a limitation designed to show you patterns from your childhood. I believe the truth of what life is really miraculous and magical. And when we go, yeah, it's not that easy. Okay. You're bringing up a pattern based on your past story and your evidence. Um, that specific sentence, which is welcome to be there, is um, kind of just a description of how that person sees the world. And this is what that is, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are helping a bit, actually. Maybe like, like I spend a lot of time on Reddit um, and I try to find other, <laughs> maybe my problem is I spend a lot of time trying to collect a lot of point of view. Um, and I'm, we're typically influenced by what we read and what we, who we hang out with. And so, you know, there are people who think that coaches is bullshit and life coaches is bullshit. Um, you know, that they're just, um, psychologists who never went through the training that anyone who writes a book is just trying to shill something. Anyone who's a speaker is full of crap. Um, and then uh, the psycho babble and all that stuff. And it's like, it just bothers me because let me the deeper I get into this, the more I'm like, but there's a truth here. Like, even if you don't like the rapper, there's something here that works for people. So what if I ask you this? What about that bothers you? Why can't they have that opinion? Because it's from coming from the masses, and so the the masses or public opinion feels like um, 
like the majority, I guess. I don't know. Well, I don't know why. Don't know. It, it, it just feels like it's, it's making the my beliefs and my work insignificant. When well, what whenever. if we break down the masses? I don't even know that is coming from the masses, but let's say it is. Yeah. Okay. The masses have you're a. So you're a, so good at this. A horrible <laughs> history. The masses have. We murder each other. Eighty percent or something. I don't know the actual number. Are on pills all the time. The masses are full of addictions. Constant, got to be at the bar, addictions in different areas, right? Yeah. If I don't want their life, why would I listen to their advice kind of thing, right? In jobs they hate, in relationships they hate, watching Real Housewives of Orange County, whatever. That's fine. That's their journey. It's just not mine. And so I don't choose that in the same way. But I do have the understanding that a ton of people have different blueprints. There's 8 billion different blueprints on this planet. And people that want to scream, that's bullshit. That's fine. They, they, they don't have to, that's fine. And often they are sometimes people that are the same people that are scared to ask for help or it's humbling or have a belief that they have to do everything themselves. And um, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. I mean, Tony Robbins saved my life. So that's a fact. I was going to kill myself and Tony Robbins saved my life. There were so many things that freed me through Michael Beckwith. There were so many things that freed me through Eckhart Tolle. There are so many things that changed in my life through meditation. Again, for sure, I wouldn't have my daughter. I wouldn't. Um, there's so many things that happen. I wouldn't, you know, I barely drink now, if at all. I love the wine every once in a while, but I used to drink like crazy in my 20s. Um, more addictive, more different things. And then like really going inward, like this is actual evidence that it can help someone. But obviously, if you're dragged into it, you're going to think it's bullshit if you're not. But what I would offer you is your freedom is they're totally allowed to think that your freedom is like, like I like if someone says to me, you're just a self help scam artist. I know that I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> right so i don't have to be like no like it almost validates <laughs> right like it's almost i'm like, not i'm not look at the 400,000 people i've helped <laughs> i mean the amount of things you know like one time i was doing a call and i did this with my hands and someone said i'm in the freemason illuminati <laughs> i'm like i'm not and but that because my content is allow and that ownership isn't real they think i'm saying let's bring in the world economic forum and get people to and, everything and for our listeners all he's doing is just waving his hands around. <laughs> yeah. And like, and by the way, if the Illuminati put me in as controlled opposition, I'd have a hell of a lot more followers. I'd be, you'd see me as famous as Lizzo. I wouldn't be with my little YouTube channel and my, you know, books. Like, I, like, trust me, I'm speaking from my truth, but the amount of things that when you just get big, but like, imagine, the, how powerless I am. If every time I heard a rumor about me, which just happens if you're a public figure, I have to stop it. You know, if someone said you're made of corn, or you like all of your skin is corn, you're a can of corn, this is cream corn on the neck, and you were like, no, I'm not, I'll prove it to you. This is skin. We'd be like, does he think he's a little bit corn? Like, like, you know what I'm <laughs> as opposed to just like, That is so ridiculous. It's not even worth my time. And when a homeless person says something to you when you're walking by them and they're saying something outlandish, you don't want to get in there and argue with them. You, you, As you do this work, you start to see everyone is just a screaming opinion, begging to be seen by their mom or something. And we really don't know what's true, just other than now. And your freedom is they are totally allowed to think that. Even if it's about you, they're allowed to think that about me. I It's fine. I used to not want that. I used to be like, no, you got to know. And that's fine. That's fine. It's not mine. What you think about me isn't mine. That's a Wayne Dyer quote too. What you think about me isn't my business, you know? But there's no way we're going to get everyone on the same page about (laughs) self-help. Yeah. You know? Kyle. Man, I feel like this is a gift you've just given. You've just given me um, for the last hour plus. Uh, no, I, I really do want to thank you. And my final question, which I love to wrap up with, because I never, I'm never quite sure where it's going to go. But for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Now, 
literally now the future exists within the now we can't go to the future it'll just be now then we're only in the now and this now i find contains the past and the future it contains everything everything from your past doesn't exist anymore so you can feel through it and alchemize it but just literally your whole now you're fine now and any pattern that doesn't believe that could be seen in the now and healed if you want it to be but you're totally free and your job is to receive it versus argue it. 